What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video, we're gonna be talking about renal auto regulation. Before we get started, please, if you guys benefit, you like this video, hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and most importantly, subscribe. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get into it. All right, Ninja Nerds, so let's start talking about renal auto regulation. What is renal auto regulation? It's just the ability of the kidney to modify its blood flow and modify the way, how much blood flow it's getting, modify the urine output in a way. Okay, so how does it do that? There's two particular mechanisms by which the kidney regulates its blood flow, regulates its urine output, so on and so forth. It does it by itself, intrinsically, and there's two particular mechanisms that the kidney does on its own without any assistance and that is called, the first one is called the myogenic mechanism. Okay, so the first one that we'll talk about is called the myogenic mechanism. It's a pretty simple and very effective one. The next one is actually regulated by the kidney tubules, okay? And it's called the tubulo glomerular feedback mechanism. It's one heck of a name. Okay, so we have the first one, which is the myogenic mechanism, and the second intrinsic mechanism is called the tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. So these ones are, again, it's the kidney's ability that any blood flow that's coming to the kidney, the kidney will sift through that, and its design is to be able to make urine, okay? If the blood pressure is too high, you'll end up making too much urine. If the blood pressure is too low, you won't make enough urine. So how does the kidney be able to modulate it where you make an appropriate amount of urine? It can do it intrinsically via these two mechanisms. Now, the extrinsic mechanisms are a little bit different. So the kidney has to, it can do it, but it needs a little assistance from things outside of it. And what are those two things? Those two things, the extrinsic mechanisms start kicking in whenever the blood pressure really becomes low. These extrinsic mechanisms really, really kick in whenever the blood pressure becomes precipitously low. The first one that we'll talk about is called the sympathetic. Okay, your sympathetic nervous system. And then the second one here is called, we're gonna abbreviate this one because it's a heck of a thing. I like to call it the renin angiotensin aldosterone ADH system. The RAS, okay? So the renin angiotensin aldosterone ADH system or axis, if you will. And again, these are the different mechanisms that we're gonna go into great detail of. So let's start first with the myogenic mechanism and then work our way through understanding how the kidneys regulate its blood flow and then therefore urine output or glomerular filtration. Okay? All right, Ninja Nerds, so let's start talking about the different intrinsic mechanisms, particularly the myogenic mechanism. So myogenic muscle. So there's gonna be some muscle involvement here. It's actually a really straightforward, pretty simple process. And so we're gonna talk about two scenarios. One is how the muscles of the afferent arterial, kind of giving it away here, modulate blood flow to the kidney, or the glomerulus particularly, whenever there's high blood pressure, and how they do it whenever there's low blood pressure. So here's the first thing I want you to remember. <clears throat> We talked about this in glomerular filtration, but basically the concept is that blood pressure is kind of a surrogate for glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So whenever the blood pressure is higher, you can say that there is a higher kind of a glomerular hydrostatic pressure, if you will. And if you remember, glomerular hydrostatic pressure is the pressure inside of the capillaries that's exerted to push things like plasma and solute components out of the capillaries and into this thing called the Bowman's capsule. That's what it is. So effectively, the higher the glomerular hydrostatic pressure, assuming all other things remain constant, like the oncotic pressure, capsular, all that stuff like that, we would say that there would be an increase in the glomerular filtration rate. All right? Now, that's what would happen. You have a higher glomerular filtration, you'd make more urine. Now, your kidneys try to modulate this a little bit to where it's not too excessive, where you're not making too much urine, or that the pressure doesn't remain too high that you cause a lot of injury and you know, uh, exertion of effect on these actual glomerular capillaries. So how does it do this? All right, whenever there is high blood pressure, okay? You know the structures here of this little diagram? This is your afferent arterial. This is the glomerulus. We'll denote this with like a G here. This is the efferent arterial. This green thing here is called the Bowman's capsule. And this first part here of the tubules is called the proximal convoluted tubule here, right? Well, you know blood flow 
it moves through the afferent arterial and then exits out the efferent arterial. Whenever there's high blood pressure, okay? So there's high blood pressure. We already know that it's gonna cause higher glomerular hydrostatic pressure. You'll cause more filtration to come out of these glomerular capillaries and more blood to come, more urine to be made via an increase in glomerular filtration. Now, how do we counteract this? Here's what happens. As more higher blood pressure is occurring, there's more blood that's flowing through, there's higher pressure in the afferent arterial. Imagine we zoom in on one of those smooth muscle cells and look and see what happens here. If there's higher blood pressure, what this is gonna do is, this high blood pressure is gonna exert a lot of force and pressure and stress and stretching on the smooth muscle cells of the afferent arterial. So as a result, these bad boys are gonna have an increase in stretch. Well, you know, whenever they're stretched a lot, they have these like channels here that are sodium channels that are very sensitive to stretch. So whenever there's an increase in stretch, these sodium channels open and the sodium will flood in. When the sodium floods in, that makes the inside of the cell super positive, which is a stimulator to what's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is like a calcium storage within smooth muscle cells. When this is stimulated, it starts unloading that calcium into the smooth muscle cell like it's going out of style. If there's lots of calcium inside of this smooth muscle cell from that increased stretch, what's gonna happen? There's gonna be more binding of myosin to actin and they'll be increasing contraction as a result of that. When you cause more smooth muscle cells of the afferent arterial to contract, it's gonna induce what's called vasoconstriction. Okay, so it's gonna do a vasoconstriction type of mechanism. Now, imagine that from that high blood pressure, these afferent arterials just clamp down. If they clamp down, what does that do to the amount of blood, the volume of blood that can run through the afferent arterial? Little hole, less volume. So there's gonna be a lower glomerular blood flow, we'll put GBF here, right? That lower glomerular blood flow, if less blood is flowing through here, are you gonna be able to make as much of that, push as much of that plasma out here into the glomerular capsule? Capsule, no. So low glomerular blood flow will result in a lower glomerular filtration rate. So as a result, there'll be less filtration here and there'll be a lower glomerular filtration rate as the corrective or compensation or autoregulatory mechanism here. Okay, so with that being said, with low blood pressure, it should be very easy now. It's the exact opposite here. Low blood pressure means an effective lower glomerular hydrostatic pressure, which would mean that there will be a lower GFR. So how do we counteract that? Because if the blood pressure is low, and this is where it's really the problem is when the blood pressure is low. If the blood pressure is low and we're not making urine, that can cause a kidney injury, right? We don't want that. So how does our kidneys try to help prevent that? Well, it's pretty smart, actually. Again, to quickly recap here, this is the, this little diagram. This is our afferent arterial, efferent arterial. This is our glomerulus here. This is our Bowman's capsule. This is our proximal convoluted tube, the first part here, right? We have blood flowing through the afferent arterial, exits via the efferent arterial. Now, the blood pressure is low. If there's low blood pressure, that means that there's less force or stress or stretching of the afferent arterial. So come back over here, zooming in on a smooth muscle cell here. If there is less stretch, okay, so there's a lower blood pressure that's less force and stretching on this actual smooth muscle cell, a decrease in stretch those stretch receptors, I mean the, the, the sodium channels that are very sensitive to stretch, they're not gonna be as sensitive now. So now less sodium is gonna enter in to these smooth muscle cells. If less sodium enters into the smooth muscle cells, there's less positive charge. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, you ain't gonna respond to no, you know, not as much positive charge. So it's gonna be like, uh-uh, I'm not pushing calcium out. And so because of that, less calcium is present in the actual sarcoplasm. That means less interaction between actin and myosin, and that means less contraction. Another way that I want us to think about this is that there's less contraction, that also means that there's kind of more relaxation of the muscle, right? It's kind of like the, 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 you know, the, the associated kind of opposite effect here. Less contraction, meaning it's probably gonna relax a lot more. If the smooth muscles relax within this vessel, we call this effectively vasodilation, okay? So we're gonna effectively call this vaso 
dilation. Now, vasodilation, imagine these blood vessels, the afferent arterial kind of plumping up, opening up really wide and allowing for larger volume of blood, more flow to run within that blood vessel. As a result here, now I'm gonna have an increase, right, in the glomerular blood flow. If I have an increase in the glomerular blood flow, then I technically am gonna have more volume running in here, and I effectively should have more filtration. And if that's the case, I should have an increase in GFR, or an attempt to increase the GFR through this mechanism when the blood pressure is low. An easy way to summate all of this is what? When the blood pressure is high, it causes the GFR to go up. How do we counteract that? How do our kidneys do that? They undergo vasoconstriction. So high blood pressure triggers vasoconstriction, causing low GFR. Summating the low blood pressure, which is the more important thing. Low blood pressure leads to low GFR. That's a problem because then the kidneys can't make urine. That can lead to a kidney injury. How does our kidneys protect? That leads to vasodilation of the afferent arterial and an increase in the effective GFR. That covers the myogenic. Now let's cover tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. All right, so we talked about the myogenic mechanism. Now let's talk about the tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. So this one's a very cool one, okay? It can get it kind of complicated, but we're gonna break it down to the simplest explanation. All right, so we have to talk about two scenarios. What happens in this mechanism when the blood pressure is too high? What happens when the blood pressure is too low? It's kind of the same thing we talked about with the, uh, the myogenic mechanism. But the same concept here is if we get to it, is that a high BP, increase in glomerular hydrostatic pressure, effectively and ultimately, it results in an increase in the glomerular filtration rate. Low blood pressure, low glomerular hydrostatic pressure, eventually uh, it'll lead to a low glomerular filtration rate. Okay, so that's kind of the end result here, right? So we can kind of effectively kind of follow this out here, that again, with our diagram here, this is our afferent arterial, this is our efferent arterial, this is our glomerulus, this is our Bowman's capsule, this is our proximal convoluted tubule. We won't have to explain it here for that one. But high blood pressure, right? Run, things run from afferent to efferent arterial. As it does that, higher blood pressure, you're gonna have more filtration. Now, here's what we gotta be really specific. We are having a higher GFR, right? Now we're having an increase in our glomerular filtration rate effectively. But what are we filtering? We already talked a little bit about this. We're filtering out plasma, we're filtering out solutes. But this mechanism is really, really specific for a very particular molecule called sodium chloride. So it's very sensitive for sodium chloride. So we say that technically, when there's a high GFR, you're actually causing more sodium chloride to get filtered as well. So more sodium chloride is filtering into the actual Bowman's capsule and then the proximal convoluted tubule, right? And the same concept here, and again, this is high BP, high glomerular filtration, more sodium chloride is actually being filtered into the kidney tubules. Again, afferent arterial, efferent arterial, glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule here. Blood flows here, exits here, but should filter here the glomerulus. Low BP, low glomerular filtration rate, that effectively means that less solute and less plasma is filtered, but the more particular one is sodium chloride, that less sodium chloride is filtered here. So that's what I want you to take away from this first part here, regardless of high BP or low BP. What we can kind of say with this mechanism at this point is high BP, high GFR, high sodium chloride excretion into the kidney tubules. Low BP, low GFR, low sodium chloride excretion into the kidney tubules, okay? Let's continue to follow that down though. So let's say that we take the sodium chloride and we move down, right? So let's continue down here. We have just an expanded version of kind of our nephron, right? So here we're gonna say this is the afferent arterial, this is the efferent arterial. So afferent arterial, efferent arterial here, okay? This is the Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule. This is the loop of Henle. This is the ascending, so this is your descending, ascending, so that's why we call it just the loop of Henle distal convoluted tubule, and then the collecting duct, right? The real points that I want you to focus on is the distal convoluted tubule, really. Okay, so we have here high blood pressure. We're filtering off lots of sodium chloride. Where does most of the sodium chloride get reabsorbed? In the proximal convoluted tubule. But let's say, just imagine, 
that the sodium chloride transporters, they got saturated. They're like, man, I can't keep up with all of this sodium chloride that's out here. I can't juggle all of this. So some of the sodium chloride kind of escapes past the proximal convoluted tubule. It moves down through the loop of Henle. And it finally gets to this distal convoluted tubule where you have some special cells here, some special sodium chloride sensors in the distal convoluted tubule. What are these cells here called? Let's write them in purple so that they shine, shine bright like a diamond. These are called macula densa cells. And these are special sodium chloride sensors. Whenever they sense that there is a high amount of sodium and a high amount of chloride, they are very sensitive to that and they release a very particular type of molecule in response to that. Okay? This molecule is called what? This molecule, we're actually going to have it released over here on this side because it's going to interact with a very particular part in this nephron. Okay? It's going to release a molecule called adenosine. And adenosine is going to act on a particular part here in the afferent arterial that we have to discuss down here. Okay, but we'll do that in just a second. What I want you to recap here is high BP, high GFR, high sodium chloride excretion to the kidney tubules. If there's lots of sodium chloride in the proximal convoluted tubule, a lot of it can actually not get reabsorbed. And if a lot of it gets down to the distal convoluted tubule cells, it causes the macula densa cells to sense that and release adenosine. Let's talk about the opposite scenario. If we go here, again, afferent arterial, efferent arterial, this is our Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, this is the distal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, and then again the collecting duct, with more focus here on the distal convoluted tubule. Again, blood will flow through the afferent arterial, out the efferent arterial, and you should get some filtration here at the glomerulus. We had low BP, low GFR, so there's low amounts of sodium chloride here in the proximal convoluted tubule. That gives the proximal convoluted tubule plenty of time to reabsorb tons and tons of that sodium chloride. So if we were to trace this sodium chloride down as it goes throughout all of this process and it finally gets to the distal convoluted tubule, these macula densa cells, okay, those special uh, sodium uh, chloride sensors, there's gonna be very little sodium chloride by the time it gets to the distal convoluted tubule. So there's low amounts of sodium and there's low amounts of chloride by the time it gets here. The macula densa cells in response to that actual low sodium and low chloride release two particular molecules. And these are called PGI2 and nitric oxide. And these will act on particular components within the afferent arterial as well. So, super quick recap. High BP, high GFR, high sodium chloride excretion in the kidney tubules. High amounts of sodium chloride get to the distal convoluted tubule. Macula densa cells release adenosine. Low BP, low GFR, low sodium chloride excretion into the kidney tubules. Less sodium chloride gets down to the DCT. Macula densa cells sense the low sodium chloride, release PGI2 and nitric oxide. Now, what does adenosine do in this area of the afferent arterial and what does PGI2 and nitric oxide do in this area of the afferent arterial? That's what we have to discuss next. So let's go over here. All right, so we're here and we had, let's say that we just kind of had it released here. We kind of show it that it was released here was the adenosine. The adenosine can do two things. One is it can act on the smooth muscle cells, right? So this is our afferent arterial. This is our efferent arterial. It's going to act on the afferent arterial and cause it to clamp down. Okay? It's going to cause it to clamp down. If the actual afferent arterial clamps down or undergoes vasoconstriction, so what would be the response here? Here, if we were to kind of write this out, we're going to have a vaso constriction of the what? Afferent arterial. What does that mean then? If it constricts, it's smaller diameter. Less blood flow is running through there. That results in a lower glomerular blood flow. That means less filtration is gonna occur. If there's less filtration, that's a lower glomerular filtration rate. That means that less sodium chloride is being 
filtered. Less sodium chloride being filtered is the opposite of the original issue. We fixed the issue. We lowered the GFR. We lowered the sodium chloride excretion. Beautiful. That's fixed. Something else it does is very interesting. So here we're going to have adenosine here, like it was released from the mac. Here we'll put macula densa uh, cells, right? We'll abbreviate it MDC. Macula densa cells. They release the adenosine. The adenosine acts there, causes the vasoconstriction. There's another thing it does. Adenosine will act on these uh, these cells that are present around the afferent arterial. You know these cells that are present around the afferent arterial? They're very specialized cells. They're called J G cells. They stand for juxtaglomerular cells. Not a chance in this world I'm writing that out. The J G cells are very special because they contain granules of what's called renin. Now renin activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and their whole goal is what I want you to remember here is to increase blood pressure right and increase sodium chloride reabsorption all that stuff if the issue was I had high blood pressure would I want the JG cells to release renin effectively increasing blood pressure no so adenosine is actually going to inhibit the JG cells from releasing renin and so there will be no renin release and we won't activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone adh axis okay but let's come over here now you guys are already getting like you already know what's going to happen right it has to be the opposite here we release those macula densa cells released what's called pgi2 and nitric oxide that's going to act on again what is this structure here this is the afferent arterial efferent arterial here Blood flows here, exits here, and it should filter in the middle of the glomerulus. PGI2 and nitric oxide are going to act on the smooth muscle cells of the afferent arterial. And when it does that, it causes these smooth muscle cells to undergo a relaxation, causing them to vasodilate. So effectively, you're going to cause vasodilation of what? The afferent arterial. That's going to widen it up. More blood flow can run through there, so there'll be effectively an increase in the glomerular blood flow. More blood flowing through will have more filtration. If there's an increase in the glomerular filtration rate, you're going to increase the amount of sodium chloride that's being excreted. That's fixing the issue where you had the low GFR and the low sodium chloride. Now, that's one part. The other part here is that the PGI2 and nitric oxide will act on these cells over here, the JG cells. Again, the JG cells are responsible for releasing renin. What was the original issue? The blood pressure was low. What does renin, what will it want to do? Increase your blood pressure. So what I want the JG cells to become stimulated so that they can release renin, effectively increasing the blood pressure. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm gonna trigger that process. And so it's going to stimulate the JG cells and cause them to release renin. And so we'll put like an up arrow here so that you know that, and then a down arrow here so that you know that, right? Increase in renin, it'll activate the whole renin angiotensin aldosterone system indirectly whenever there's low BP, okay? That covers the tubular glomerular feedback. Let's talk about the sympathetic nervous system. All right, engineers, so let's talk about the extrinsic mechanisms for renal autoregulation. So this is, again, the, the kidney is starting to now need some assistance from some other systems, and this is where the nervous system kind of kicks in. So really, this extrinsic mechanism doesn't really kick in until the blood pressure is like relatively low. So these this, this two extrinsic mechanisms, they're really more particular that we re what we really need to know, we're not gonna go over them when, the high, when there's high blood pressure. It's easy, we can quickly blow through it. But I want us to focus more on these two extrinsic mechanisms when the blood pressure is low because that's when these pathways are a little bit more involved. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system will really become involved whenever like your systolic blood pressure is really plummeting. Okay, so as it starts to become relatively low, so the point where the mean arterial pressure starts becoming like less than like 65, really, okay? So less than 60, if you really wanted to remember that, we can say really MAP is a, is a measure of perfusion, right? So when the MAP starts becoming like less than 65 millimeters of mercury, we're not perfusing the kidney as well. And that can cause kidney injury. So the sympathetic nervous system kind of tries to kick in really whenever our blood pressure is getting really low because it has to allow for say, okay, kidney, 
You're important, but you're not as important as the heart, the brain, muscles, other tissues that need this blood flow. So I'm gonna kinda have to take blood flow a little bit away from you and divert it to a little bit more of the principal important organs. And so that's kind of the, the issue that we'll run into here with the sympathetic nervous system. So let's kinda talk about this. Whenever there's low blood pressure, right? We know that effectively when we talk about it with the kidney that low blood pressure is gonna lead to a low GFR, right? And that low GFR is gonna lead to effectively, it can lead to a low urine output. And the problem with this is that this can lead to kidney injury. If you have less blood flow going to the kidney, not only are you decreasing the urine output, but you can cause kidney injury. And that, unfortunately, the sympathetic nervous system doesn't respect that. We have other mechanisms that'll try to protect that. But it will do its best to try to get blood flow to increase. So how does it do that? When the blood pressure is low, you know there's specialized types of receptors, like baroreceptors, that are present here within kind of the carotid sinus and the aortic sinus, and they pick up whenever there's low blood pressure. And these, there's nerves that carry these signals here, okay? We have like the vagus nerve, and then we also have the glossopharyngeal nerve. And the glossopharyngeal nerve, okay, so we'll have the vagus nerve, and then we'll have the glossopharyngeal nerve, they're picking up sensations from these baroreceptors. So whenever the BP is low, it's gonna trigger these baroreceptors, and it's gonna cause these two nerves to kind of send signals to our brainstem, particularly in the medulla. When it sends these signals to the medulla, the medulla will say, hey, I'm getting less signals from cranial nerve uh, nine and 10, from, especially from the bare receptors. The blood pressure must be low. That's not good. Let me ramp up the sympathetic nervous system centers here. And so what it does is, it'll activate particular sympathetic nerve fibers in the thoracic part of the spinal cord and other parts here. And this will do a couple things. One is it'll cause the release of, an increase in the release of norepinephrine, an increase in the epinephrine in the heart. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna act on the nodal systems. And when it acts on the nodal system, it'll attempt to increase your heart rate. Because you know when you increase heart rate, that increases what? effectively cardiac output, which will try to increase your blood pressure. That's the goal. It's also going to increase your contractility of the heart. So it's gonna increase the stroke volume. If you increase these two things effectively, that should increase the cardiac output and increase the blood pressure because the whole goal is if I increase the blood pressure, I can increase the perfusion or more blood to go to the kidney so that the kidney doesn't get injured. Okay, I'll do my best. But at this point in time, my goal is getting blood flow to other tissues, the heart, the muscles, the brain. Those have to take precedence. Okay, but that's one of the mechanisms that it'll do. The other mechanism here, and again, here's an important thing to remember. What are the receptors that are actually responsible for increasing heart rate? These are the beta-1 receptors. So it'll stimulate the beta-1 receptors that are present on the SA node, the AV node, but it'll also stimulate the beta-1 receptors that are present on the contractile myocardial tissue. Okay, that's important, so beta-1 receptors there. So again, it's stimulating the beta-1 receptors for increase in chronotropic action, increasing the activity of the beta-1 receptors, increasing inotropic action, contractility. Now, the sympathetic nervous system fibers also We'll do another thing. They'll act on the alpha-1 receptors. So what are these here called? These are called, here we'll kind of put like a little receptor here. These are called your alpha-1 receptors. And these are present on the, what is this? Afferent arterial, efferent arterial. Blood flow moves from afferent arterial to efferent arterial, right? Remember what I told you? That unfortunately the sympathetic nervous system, he don't respect the kidney. He don't respect them. So what he says is, I gotta get blood pressure up, unfortunately, kidney. I tried to do it through this mechanism to perfuse, perfuse you a little bit, but unfortunately, I need blood flow to go to other organs. And so it releases norepinephrine, it releases epinephrine, which will bind onto the alpha-1 receptors of the afferent arterial and cause vasoconstriction. So what's the effect here? It's gonna cause vasoconstriction. 
If I vasoconstrict the afferent arterioles, how much blood flow is gonna be able to move through there? Not very much. And so there'll be a decrease in the glomerular blood flow and effectively a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. You're probably like, Zach, the, I thought the goal was to try to increase the GFR. It is, that's the goal. But unfortunately, in a sympathetic crisis where your blood pressure is really low, the sympathetic nervous system don't, don't respect the kidneys. And so it says, hey, I gotta try to get blood flow to other organs like the heart, the muscles, the brain, so I'm gonna have to take it from the kidney, unfortunately. So that's one thing that can happen here, right? Now, the other thing that happens within the sympathetic nervous system is not only is there alpha-1 receptors that are present here on the, um, the smooth muscle of the afferent arterial, but guess where else they're present? On the alpha-1 receptors that are present within uh, vessels all over the place. So we have alpha-1 receptors that are on kind of our peripheral vessels here. So here's an alpha-1 receptor. What will happen is, these fibers, like if we were to kind of track this down here, well, it's gonna get too messy. So just imagine here that these fibers, here, we'll do it like this so it doesn't get too crazy. That's not bad, actually. So we're gonna release out here the epinephrine and the norepinephrine. And they're gonna act on not only the alpha-1 receptors of the afferent arterial, but let's just call these the systemic vessels, so systemic arteries. It's gonna act on these vessels here, on that alpha-1 receptor, and induce vasoconstriction of multiple systemic vessels. If you cause vasoconstriction of multiple systemic vessels, what that does is, is it increases the systemic vascular resistance. And if you increase the systemic vascular resistance, you increase the blood pressure. So the whole goal, if you're getting the point here, is that the sympathetic nervous system wants to increase blood pressure, that would be nice if it would help the kidney, but unfortunately it says, hey, your kidney, I gotta reduce a little bit of blood flow to you by constricting the afferent arterial. But it also constricts all arterioles that our alpha-1 receptors are present on. Okay? Now, so far, what do we have? Sympathetic nervous system causes increase in heart rate, increase in stroke volume, increase in cardiac output, blood pressure, through the beta-1 receptors. Acts on the alpha-1 receptors here of the afferent arterial, causing vasoconstriction, reducing GFR. Acts on the alpha-1 receptors of the systemic vessels, causes increase in systemic vascular resistance, increasing blood pressure. The last thing here is, you have cells that are present in the afferent arterial, and they have beta-1 receptors that are present here. And again, the increase in epinephrine, the increase in neuroepinephrine will bind on to the beta-1 receptors on these particular cells and trigger the release of a very particular hormone. These cells, you guys already know them. We wrote them over here, we'll write them in purple. These cells here are called your JG cells. And again, what does the JG cells do whenever they're stimulated? Release epinephrine, norepinephrine, they stimulate the beta-1 receptors, they trigger the release of renin. What does renin do? You guys know, we'll talk about it in a second. It activates eventually a molecule called angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is gonna do a bunch of different mechanisms that we're not gonna go ahead and talk about now because we're gonna talk about it in a second here. But this is what I want you guys to get the overall point of. So to quickly recap, sympathetic nervous system gets activated when the blood pressure is really low. What does it do? First thing, Increases your heart rate, increases your stroke volume to increase cardiac output blood pressure. Second thing, causes the vasoconstriction of the afferent arterioles to get more blood flow to other organs, not the kidney, unfortunately, other organs that are a little bit more high priority. Third thing, causes vasoconstriction of systemic arterioles via the alpha-1 receptor to increase blood pressure. And the fourth thing is it triggers renin release from the beta-1 receptors on the kidney, okay? All of this would be the exact opposite if the blood pressure was high, right? You wouldn't have as much of this sympathetic effect. You'd have lower heart rate, lower stroke volume, lowering the blood pressure. You'd have less alpha-1 receptor vasoconstriction, so you'd have more GFR. You wouldn't have renin release, and you wouldn't have this vasoconstriction of the vessels. Here in the periphery, you'd have vasodilation. So everything that we said for low BP, it'd be the exact opposite for high BP, okay? Now that we covered this, let's cover the final mechanism, the most important one of them all, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone-ADH axis. 
All right, engineers, the last one, renin angiotensin aldosterone ADH axis. This is, a, this is the best one. It's the most important one really out of all of these. Again, we're gonna focus on the low BP, but it's gonna be easy. We'll talk about that for high BP. And it's actually like one particular hormone that I want you to remember. So thankfully it's not too bad. Okay, first thing, you have low blood pressure, right? Why is this an issue? Okay, we already know all this stuff. This, this, this should honestly be so dang easy at this point. Low BP, low glomerular hydrostatic pressure that leads to a low GFR, right? Low GFR, that's kind of a problem, right? We're not making much urine because of that. So if we were to kind of look here at like the kidney here, okay? And again, we have the afferent arterial here. We have the efferent arterial here. And again, we know that blood flow through here, through here, exits, and then there should be some filtration process here in the middle. Now, if you have low blood pressure, okay, guess what? There's some special cells that we've talked about before that not only do they, are they sensitive to like adenosine, to prostacycline, nitric oxide, the sympathetic nervous system, all of that, but they're also just sensitive on their own to blood pressure changes, particularly whenever either the blood pressure is high or the blood pressure is low. So we're gonna kind of highlight here, here's your JG cells, okay? They're gonna be here in that afferent arterial. Whenever the blood pressure is low, so you got low BP, these JG cells respond to that. They say, man, there's some low blood pressure. Huh. That's not good. I need to try to get the blood pressure up. So what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna release a molecule called renin. Because again, what was the issue? That low BP was resulting in lower glomerular hydrostatic pressure. It was resulting in lo lower glomerular filtration rate, right? So we have to try to be able to fix this in some way, as well as increase the blood pressure so that we can try to perfuse the kidney a little bit more. We're gonna try to, some mechanisms here, right? So when the renin is released, renin is kind of like a really cool enzyme. Your liver makes a very particular type of protein here. It's one heck of a name, but this protein that the liver makes is called angiotensinogen. And what happens is renin is gonna act like an enzyme and it's gonna actually kind of cleave a couple amino acids off of angiotensinogen. When it cleaves angiotensinogen, it converts it into a molecule called angiotensin-1. Angiotensin-1 will then move to a capillaries within the lungs. And you know within the lungs, there's a very special enzyme that the lungs, uh, the capillary endothelium within the lungs have, which is called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. And what this enzyme does is it stimulates the conversion, it cleaves off a couple amino acids of angiotensin 1 and converts him effectively into what's called angiotensin 2. Now this is our money maker here. This is where all of it starts to really just happen. Angiotensin 2 does so many different things. What are some of the things that he does? Okay, first one, let's kind of drag him over here. So the first thing is we're gonna kind of see what it does here to your central nervous system. The central nervous system has a very particular structure in this area, the hypothalamus, and then it has a structure that hangs here called the pituitary gland, right? When this stimulates the hypothalamus, it stimulates the posterior pituitary and triggers the release of a very special type of hormone called ADH. So there's gonna be an effective increase in this hormone. It actually stimulates particular cells within the hypothalamus that trigger the release of ADH from the posterior pituitary. ADH is a very special hormone. It's also called vasopressin, antidiuretic hormone. But what it does is, is it acts on the cells in the collecting duct. You know the cells within the collecting duct? Uh, they're very, very impermeable to water. But what happens is when ADH is present, it puts these little aquaporins present inside of the actual uh, tubular membrane. And then what happens is water can actually funnel into these actual tubular cells and into the actual bloodstream. So effectively, we get an increase in water reabsorption in the blood, 
And if there's an increase of water in the blood, that's gonna increase your blood volume. And if you increase your blood volume, you increase your blood pressure. What was the issue? Low BP. If we increase the BP, we can actually get more blood flow to go to the kidney so that the kidney can increase its GFR effectively. Man, that's pretty cool, right? All right, what else? Angiotensin II can also, you know another thing that it also can do with the hypothalamus if you really wanna remember here, it can also just make you thirsty. And if you have, you have an increase in thirst, you'll drink more water, you drink more water, you increase your blood volume, you increase your blood pressure, and increase the GFR, right? So it's kind of same kind of concept here. But anyway, it also can act on the adrenal cortex. You know the adrenal cortex? Okay, so we'll put here the adrenal cortex, particularly what's called the uh, zona glomerulosa. You know the cells that make a particular hormone called Aldosterone, here we'll put ZG, zona glomerulosa, triggers the release of a hormone called aldosterone. Now, aldosterone likes to work on a very particular area which is also relatively impermeable to sodium and water naturally. And this is the distal convoluted tubule, right? This was the collecting duct, okay? The collecting tubule, the collecting duct, this is the distal convoluted tubule, this portion here. Aldosterone acts on these distal convoluted tubule cells and makes them permeable to sodium and makes them permeable to water. So then you reabsorb sodium and you reabsorb water into the bloodstream. So now I'm gonna get more sodium and water into the bloodstream. If you increase sodium and you increase water into the bloodstream, you effectively increase blood volume. If you increase blood volume, you increase blood pressure. You increase blood pressure, you should get more blood flow to the kidneys and increase the GFR. Man, that's making sense, right? All right, what else? Another thing that the angiotensin II does is it acts on the kidneys, okay? So it's gonna act on the kidneys itself, right? And it works in a very particular way, two particular ways. So here we're gonna have, again, the afferent arterial on this end, the efferent arterial on this end. Angiotensin II will bind onto these angiotensin II receptors that are present on the efferent arterial. And when angiotensin II binds onto these receptors, it causes these these vessels, the efferent arterial, to undergo vasoconstriction. So what's the result of this? It's gonna cause vasoconstriction, but very, very particular here of the efferent arterial. If you squeeze the efferent arterial, now remember, blood flows through the afferent arterial and likes to exit through the efferent arterial. Imagine that the efferent arterial is really small, so less blood can escape from the glomerulus. More blood will stay in the glomerulus. If more blood stays in the glomerulus, then more of it can be filtered out. There's a longer transit time. And so because of that, you are going to increase the glomerular filtration rate. It's kind of like a nice little protective mechanism that angiotensin II has. Pretty cool, right? All right, another thing that it's gonna do Angiotensin II also acts on cells within the beginning part of the nephron. You know, this is the proximal convoluted tubule. Well, what it does is, it also is gonna act here, so here's angiotensin II acting on the proximal convoluted tubule. It'll actually cause these cells to increase their reabsorption of sodium and water. So if I reabsorb more sodium and water into the actual bloodstream, I increase sodium, I increase water, I increase blood volume, I increase blood pressure. Again, if I increase blood pressure, I increase perfusion to the kidney, increase the GFR. So it's a pretty cool mechanism that angiotensin II here has on the actual kidneys. Now. Some books say that it does act on the afferent arterial, but what you should remember is that the angiotensin II effect on the efferent arterial is much greater than the effect on the afferent arterial. And thank goodness for that because there at least is some protective effect there for the kidneys. Okay, <laughs> we're almost done here with the aspect of angiotensin II. Now angiotensin II also is a very, very potent vasoconstrictor, very potent. 
So if we look at like your systemic arterioles or your systemic vessels here, we'll just put arterioles, but you know, your systemic vessels here, particularly arteries, it's gonna act on these vessels, okay? Again, the angiotensin II receptors. And when it does that, again, this is angiotensin II here, it's gonna cause these vessels to really, really clamp down. And so it's gonna induce a very potent vasoconstriction. When it causes this vasoconstriction, the overall effect is that you increase your systemic vascular resistance now. And if you increase your systemic vascular resistance, you increase the blood pressure, you should be able to increase your BP, increase your perfusion to the kidneys and increase GFR. Whew. That's all of the effects here. The only other thing that we have to think about now is something very interesting, okay? The opposite effect. When there's high BP, when there's high BP, this entire thing here just doesn't work. We don't release renin. We don't cause angiotensinogen to be converted into angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and all the effects of angiotensin 2 don't occur here. Okay? And if that doesn't happen, then we're not going to have all of the things that we just talked about occur. It's a pretty straightforward kind of process here. The only other thing that I do want you to remember is that when there is an increase in blood pressure, it can cause the heart to release a very particular type of molecule from the atria, and it's called atrial natriuretic peptide. An atrial natriuretic peptide will just basically, here's what I want you to remember, oppose or block any function of angiotensin II. So here's what I want you to think about. If someone said, what's the function of angiotensin II? All the opposite, I'm sorry, if anybody said, what's the function of atrial natriuretic peptide? You say it's the opposite of angiotensin II. So watch this. Atrial natriuretic peptide is gonna block each part here. If it blocks angiotensin II here, it will not lead to ADH release. If there's no ADH release, you won't reabsorb sodium and water. You'll actually urinate out lots of sodium and water. Okay, and then because of that, you'll have less bl uh, blood volume in the body and then, again, it'll try to lower your blood pressure. It's gonna block the release of aldosterone. A atrial nitrate peptide will block aldosterone release. You won't reabsorb sodium and water from the distal convoluted tubule. You'll cause more sodium and water to be released into the urine. You'll have less blood volume and less blood pressure. On the kidneys, it's gonna prevent the uh, angiotensin II from binding onto the efferent arterioles. It's not gonna undergo vasoconstriction. If it doesn't undergo vasoconstriction, it won't have this higher GFR, if you will. It'll try to lower the GFR. It'll inhibit sodium and water reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule and cause more sodium and water to be released into the urine, right? And again, it's gonna lower your blood volume. And then last but not least, angiotensin II is also gonna try to cause vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. Atrial natriuretic peptide will cause vasodilation of the blood vessels, lower your systemic vascular resistance, and lower your blood pressure. Man, we good. All right, engineers, that covers renal autoregulation. All right, engineers, in this video, we talk about renal autoregulation. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys did enjoy it. As always, engineers, until next time.